just a little foretaste of what our choir will do next week. Uh, next week we have a whole uh, we have a whole cantata we're going to be doing. At this time, I'm going to ask our kids to be dismissed for junior church. Um, that they'll be heading out the back. Now, if you, uh, if you go on YouTube and you watch the service on YouTube, you will not hear the choir on YouTube. You have to go into um, Facebook to do that. Uh, we haven't gotten permission yet to, um, um, you know, cantatas have special, um, special copyright laws that um, we have to be careful with. And so um, being that we stream our service, um, you know, it's being streamed and it's part of our service, I can't help that, um, but I did not want it on YouTube. And so if you, um, if you have somebody who usually goes on YouTube, they will not hear that song today, just so you're aware of that. Um, take your Bibles today. I want us to uh, continue our study in the character. We've been looking at the characters of Christmas. And uh, we saw last week Zacharias and, uh, and his prophecy that he gave. Um, we're going to go back in time a little bit because this happens... Uh, this song of praise happens before Zechariah's prophecy. Uh, but today we're going to look at Mary and her praise. Uh, Zechariah prophesied about the king. Mary praises God for the king. And um, we, uh, we are going to look at this here today. I, am, um, I have not uh, put anything on PowerPoint today just so we don't have to up and down with the screen and all those kind of things. We'll put the screen down one more time uh, for, our, uh, for our closing song. Uh, but, um, you know, we, I, I figure today we can, we can just open to our text. We can stay in our text. Um, I'll quote a couple verses, maybe have you turn to a couple verses, and uh, we'll go from there. And so, uh, but if you take your, your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, Pastor Russ uh, read the, um, not quite the whole, um, the whole uh, praise that Mary gave, um, but he read the context uh, that this praise was given in. And um, if, you, uh, if you know the story and understand the flow of the story, uh, in Luke chapter 1, the angel appears to Mary and announces the birth of Jesus. And in uh, verses 26 down through verse 30, um, um, uh, 38, 26 through 38, we find that Mary is told by the angel that because of her righteousness, because of her uh, faithfulness to God, God has chosen her for a specific task. And that task was to bring uh, the Son of God into the world. Um, I believe, and I believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is God, but he's also man. He was born. Um, he was born of Mary. That's the man section. That's the man part. But he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. That's God's part, and that he is fully God and he is fully man. I don't. I don't totally understand it. And there's things in Scripture we don't have to totally understand, and we don't have to. I. I, I knew a young man one time I was dealing with, and we were. Uh, I was trying to help him grow in the Lord, and, and everything I taught him, he had, to, he, he had a very analytical mind, and he had to make sure that everything made sense. Well, you know, I tried to tell him, listen, there are things in Scripture that don't always make sense. We take them by faith. And I don't know how all this took place, and I don't know uh, how God did all this, but I do know something, that the Word of God says that the light came unto the world, and the light is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Word in John chapter 1 tells us the Word became flesh. That Word, God himself, came down and became man, fully God, fully man. And he chose a vessel, and that vessel was a righteous woman named Mary. And uh, this is the context we have. Mary is just told that she was going to be with child. I don't know about you, but I tend to think that sometimes when we hear news like that. Now, you know, you could say, well, that was a, that was a good thing. You know, she's a servant of the Lord. But think about it. You're not married. You've never been with a man. And now you're pregnant. Let me ask you this. What kind of gossip do you think went on? What do you think the world around Mary 
thought through this time. See, we need to understand that Mary was asked to do a job, and that job sometimes that God asks us to do comes with difficult tasks. And it's interesting that Mary, as she was told this, the Word of God tells us, and we'll pick up right where, um, uh, right where Pastor Russ started reading in verse, actually the, the verse um, 38, that Mary said to the angel, okay, here I am, use me if that's what you want to do. I am your, hand, I am your, your maidservant, Lord, be it according to your will. Whatever your will is, Lord, I'm willing to do. And it's interesting, the next verse says, she goes on a journey. As I understand where Elizabeth and uh, Zachariah lived from where Mary lived, there was probably about a four-day journey. It took her about four days to get down there, and I believe it was during that time that she conceived, that, she, that the Holy Spirit, uh, because at the time where she was announced, it says you will conceive, you haven't conceived yet, but by the time she gets down and she talks to Elizabeth, the baby in Elizabeth leaps with joy because I believe the baby understood he was in the presence of the Savior. And that's why John the Baptist leaped with joy in his mother's womb. Okay, and so we, can't, we, we find that there's this, this, uh, this, this coming down, and, and it's, it's interesting that Elizabeth has a, a blessing, she says, but then Mary, in verse, uh, in verse 46, it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Before we look at an outline of this passage and we pull out a couple truths and a couple principles, let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for the privilege of studying your word. And Lord, I just pray that today you would give us clarity of mind. You would give us a heart that is willing to take what you have to teach us. And that, Lord, we would, uh, we would apply it to our lives. Lord, I ask that, Lord, it would not be my words, but your words, and I ask that, Lord, you move upon each and every one who's here today. Lord, I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. In this text, you know, you can take this text and you can break it down in many ways. You can break it down in many, uh, you know, many outlines. I've, I've chosen to do two things here today. Number one, um, I'd like to look at Mary's praise, and then number two, I would like to look at Mary's humbleness. Mary's praise is introduced to us in verses 40, uh, 47 and 40, uh, 40, uh, 46 and 47, sorry. Um, it's introduced to us in those passages, and then it's described in verses 49 down through verse 55. And so we're going to look, first of all, at, um, at, at Mary's praise. And it's interesting, I think, first of all, in verses 46 and 47, um, we find her desire to praise God. She has a desire to praise Him. And you notice what it says in this text. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And then it says, my spirit rejoices. Both her soul and spirit, uh, we find, was, uh, was, was turned towards God. Now, I've, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what you tend to believe. I believe the, the, the man is, is made up of three parts. It's made up of the spirit, soul, and body. And I believe that the spirit is that, is that part of us that's the spiritual realm, if we can call it that, that communicates with God. Okay? When our spirit is not right, when, when our spirit says, I don't want to communicate to God, that's when you know, we struggle. Okay? But there's that spirit that communicates to God. That spirit also takes what God communicates to us and it communicates that to our soul. Our soul is the seed of our emotions. Our soul is the, is the thinking, is, the, is the, you know, our, our, our being, who we are. Okay, and, and, and it's the Spirit then who takes the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God it speaks to our spirit, and it's the Spirit of God or, or our spirit then who speaks to our soul. Okay, and then it's the soul who then tells the body what to do. Okay, so we're, we're, we're formed of those three areas. And the Word of God says that the, 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 her spirit and her soul, both her her. Uh, spiritual realm as well as her mental intelli intellectual realm was focused on the Lord. Okay, and because her, um, her soul was focused on the Lord, her actions 
followed and followed the Lord. See, when our mind and our soul is focused on the Lord, our actions will follow. And we find this with Mary. Okay, Mary had a desire. She had a desire to worship and magnify the Lord is what the Word of God says. It's interesting, the word magnify here in this verse has the idea of enlarging. It has the idea of, of taking something that is small and magnifying and making it bigger. Okay, and I think the picture here is that what Mary was trying to do is, is recognize or, or make God look bigger or look better through what she had to say. And I really think that's what glorifying is. You know, many times in our, in our, um, in our practice for our praise team, and I open in prayer, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, help us make you look good today. Okay, that I believe is the definition of what glory is. We are here to make God look good. What is the chief purpose of man? According to catechism, the chief purpose of man is to what? To glorify God, to make God look good. See, we tend to think, I'm going to glorify God, so I'm going to make me look good. No, no, no. We make God look good. All we do is to magnify Him, make Him bigger in our lives, make Him stronger in our lives, make Him have rule over all things of our life. This is what Mary's talking about here. Okay, and this is the picture of the desire she had of glorifying God, this picture of, of magnifying God. She magnified God with her soul and with her spirit. That's what the Word of God says. With her whole being, she turned over to God. You know, I've found many times as Christians, we, uh, we, we serve the Lord one day a week. Sundays. Sunday is God's day. And I'm going to be real religious, and I'm not going to do anything on Sunday, but I'm going to give it all to the Lord. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I can do whatever I want because I've magnified the Lord. That's not what Mary did here. The Word of God says Mary magnified the Lord with her whole body. The picture we have here is that Mary magnified God seven days a week, 24 hours a day, all times she wanted God to have his way. And I really believe we see that also in verse 38 where he says, let it be done according to your will. Lord, I'm going to step out of this and I'm going to let you do what you want to do. You know, I think first, I, I, I think just as we, as we see Mary's desire to praise the Lord, there's a lesson we learn here. And I think this lesson is that Sometimes God asks us to do things and get out of our comfort zones. We'll, we so often talk about our comfort zone. You know what a comfort zone is? That comfort zone is that area which, which I have no problem serving the Lord in, in this little box because it's comfortable for me. You know, I, yes, I, I, I like kids so I can, I can talk to kids without any problems. But you know something? Going into a senior home, I don't like that very much, so I stay away from that. You know, I have found that if God calls you to do something, you better have the response that Mary had as a believer. Lord, here am I. Lord, do what you want with my will. Not my, not my will, but thine will be done. You know, I, I think we need, to, we need to understand that God many times asks us to get out of our comfort zone to serve him. Many times. He asks us to, to do things that, that we, we cringe at a little bit. Is that, is that? You know, I'm not saying that we compromise the Word of God. And I'm not saying that we, that we do things that are contrary to the Word of God. I'm saying that when we walk with God, God calls us to do things that people are going to look at us. People are going to make fun of us. People are going to question us. People are going to, they did that with Mary. But Mary still had a desire to say, okay, Lord, in it all, I'm going to glorify you. When's the last time you went through a struggle and you gave God the glory for it? Not, not Lord, take this away. I'm not talking about praying God. Mary could have cried out, Lord, I don't want this. But Mary didn't do that. Mary accepted the challenge that God gave her. And in doing so, she praised God for it. My question to you is, have you magnified God for what you're going through right now? But pastor, you don't understand. 
No, I don't understand. But if God has called you to do something, he's also given you the ability to do it, to come through it, because he never asks us something that we cannot handle. He always gives us the strength to deal with it. Now, what a lesson that is, isn't it? A lesson of just trusting God day by day, hour by hour. I'll tell you this, I'm not always faithful in that area. Oh, I know what you're saying. Oh, pastor. But, you know, if we're being honest, none of us are faithful in doing everything God wants us to do. Why? Because we have phobias. We have fears. We, you know, we're, we're you know, the, the Word of God tells us in in uh, first in second timothy chapter chapter one and verse seven that god has not given us a spirit of fear of a timid timidity why paul's reminding timothy that listen there are days where you're going to get up and you're not going to you're, you're you're not going to want to share with that person you meet the gospel of jesus christ or or you're going to be in a situation where where you're just a little concerned that if you say something in a positive light just Maybe even just saying praise the Lord is going to cause some kind of pressure on you and, and, and you're, a little, you're a little timid about doing that. And God says he's not given us a spirit of fear or of timidity, but of courage and of sound mind and of love. This is who God has said, listen, I am with you no matter where you go. And, and you know, we need to be faithful in living a life for Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we need to magnify God that he sees us. You know, I love that verse in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. I talk about it on a regular basis, but that verse basically says this, that the world will see our good deeds, our works for God. They will see how we live for the Lord. They will see what we're doing for the Lord. They will see how we're talking about the Lord. They will see all these things in our life. And that verse goes on and says, and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. They will see Christ, God, through you. Does the world see God through your life at work? Does the world see God in your life on Tuesday afternoon when you're with your friends? Does the world see God in your life every day of the week? It needs to. First, we see her desire to praise the Lord. Secondly, we see the reasons why she praises the Lord. In verses, um, in verses 47 down through verse uh, 55, we find, um, uh, I think I, I came up with seven or eight uh, different reasons why Mary chose to praise the Lord. The first one is found in verse 47, and it says this, my, um, And my spirit has, re uh, has rejoiced in God my salvation. The first thing she praises the Lord for is the salvation she receives through God. Listen, uh, you know, I, I, read, I read some different commentaries, and I'm not sure who said this, um, but several had said that, uh, that they believed that, you know, Mary was looking at the physical deliverance that Israel was looking for because, because salvation in the Old Testament many times is associated with a physical deliverance from, from the oppressors. And I think Mary was looking for that. But I also think because of her communication with God that she had earlier in this text, I think she was also understanding that this child would be the savior of the world in a spiritual sense. And I think she was praising the Lord that God, you are my savior physically and you're my savior spiritually. The word of God tells us that he is our Savior. He is the one who saves. Listen, if you're here today and you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, not in a baby. We always say, put your faith in a baby. It's not in a baby. Jesus Christ didn't stay a baby. He became a man and he walked this earth and he was walked this earth sinless, without sin. And he died on a cruel cross to take our sins away. And if you have not put your trust in him, you are not saved. You might say, whoa, pastor, that's awful harsh. No, I'm not saying that. The word of God is saying that. There's only one way to be saved. Jesus makes it so clear to his disciples. He says to his disciples as he's talking about heaven, he says, listen, 
There is only one way. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's not by church. It's not by what church you go to. It's not by what religion you have. It's not by, you know, it's not by doing good works. It's not by any of that. It's by putting your faith and your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I believe that Mary, as she praised the Lord, she understood and she rejoiced that God was her Savior. Do you rejoice in the fact that God is your Savior? Number two, the power of God, not just the saving power of God, but the, the power of God. Um, look, what, look what it says there in verses 49. It, in verse 49, it says this. It says, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. The term mighty here has the idea of powerful. He is the one who has the powerful arms. Later on in verse 51, he has said, uh, Mary says this, he has shown strength in his arms. The term strength here is the term authority, dominion. It's the idea that he has, he has the power and he has the dominion and the authority to rule and to, uh, to do what he says and what he's going to do. Listen, God, God is a God of power. And if you haven't, and if you don't believe me, look at the wind last night. You know, something we need to be in prayer about is our brothers and sisters out west. 200 miles, that tornado stayed on the ground. You know, I was, I was talking with Pam yesterday about it, and I thought, you know, we have a, a niece in uh, Kentucky. I don't even know if it was near her area or not. I haven't checked. Shame on me. Um, but um, the... Uh, you know, I told Pam, I said, you know, this is devastating, but to, to do it right before Christmas makes that much harder. The power of a storm is the power of God. He is the one who calms the storms. We see that in Scripture. He has power over all that. He is the one who can, who can take the storms and speak, and it stops. But he also has the power over your life and over my life. He's the giver of life and the taker of life. He's the one who allows things in our life. He's the one who allows the troubles in our life. I don't always understand every trouble, but I do know that God's in control of all circumstances. Why? Because he has the power and he has the authority. And he can do all things. And he tells us that we can do all things. Why? Because all authority is given unto me, is what he tells his disciples. And I turn around and I give it to you that you may be able to go for me. Notice what it says in verse 49. In verse 49 it says this, For he who is mighty has done great things, and holy is his name. You know, the Word of God tells us that Mary praised God not only because of, um, of who God is, what God has called her to do, and, and for salvation and for power, but also for the holiness of God. God, you're holy. It's interesting, this word holy is the same word we find in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1 in verse 16. In verse 15 and 16 of 1 Peter chapter 1, it says this, but as, he who, who, uh, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all conduct or manner of life. I think the King James there says conversation in everything you do. Be holy. Why? Because he is holy. It goes on, it says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. It's interesting, that word holy there in our text is the same, um, is the same word that's used in Philippians chapter 1 in verse 1. Philippians chapter 1 in verse 1, it says this, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. You might say, wait a minute, Pastor, you didn't say anything about holy in that verse. Let me reread it. It says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Where's holy in there? The word saint is the word holy. And what Paul is saying is this, you and I, because we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're holy. 
Okay, we have that characteristic that God has. What does it mean? It means that we're different than the world. We're set apart. We have been bought with a price, and God has set us apart. And it says, now, you need to be different so the world can see me through you. Holiness. You know the problem with Christians today? And I'm not pointing my finger at anybody because I'm just as guilty as this. But do you know what our problem is today? is we want to be like the world. And the Word of God says, no, you are different. You are holy. You are set apart. You need to act different than the world. I struggle with Facebook. Now, I know that we have a Facebook page for the church, and I know we have to have Facebook, but I struggle with Facebook. Do you know why I struggle with Facebook? Because I look at Christians on Facebook, and I see that their actions are no different than what the world's actions are doing. And I have a problem with that. Oh, they, may, they might say a few things a little bit differently, but they're, they're, in, the same, they're in the same places, and they're in the, doing the same actions, and they're doing the same. And if you put them next to each other, I remember one time I went into the Christian Academy. And, um, the, you know, the, I, I'm walking into the Christian Academy, and here's this UPS driver walking into the Christian Academy carrying boxes. And as I'm walking down, if you know the Christian Academy, they have that, that, that carport in the front of it. And, and I'm walking down the carport, go in, and, and, and all I can feel is the cement under me vibrating. Because in the chapel, they're practicing music. Okay? And the whole thing's vibrating. And it's, it's, it's you know, this, this what, what Christian Academy calls Christian rock. And I'm, I'm walking in there, and I, I go to Mrs. Gray. Okay, that's when Mrs. Gray was principal. Some of you might remember her. She was, she was the principal that just loved me so much that every time I walked in, she'd walk out the back door. I know. And she probably was going to watch this online and see that. And She was a sweet lady. She really was. She did a wonderful job as a principal. But uh, she, I, I went to her and I said, Mrs. Gray... I said, I have a problem. She said, what's your problem? I said, I walked in with a UPS driver. He could not tell the difference between Christian music and secular music when I walked into this school. I said, I have a problem with that. Why? Because the Word of God says we're different. And so when somebody walks onto your property, they should know the difference. They should see the difference. They should, they should be able to tell they're, you're different just by looking at you. We need to be very careful. You know, I, I'm, I, I, I'm going to get myself into big trouble this morning, but that's all right. You know, I grew up in France, and I have no problem with a glass of wine on my, on my table. I have no problem with that. My parents used to serve wine at the table. And you can judge that all you want, that's fine. But I also know that if my family takes a picture of me with a glass of wine in front of me and posts it online, the world doesn't know the difference between me and an alcoholic who is drinking wine. Think about that. I, again, I'm not judging anybody. I'm not saying I'm, I'm against that glass of wine. You know, I, you know we, we, we can have different opinions, but I'm saying we need to be careful because the Word of God tells us that we need to be holy. We need to be different from the world. People need to see that. Do they see that in your life? And, and, you know, I'll be the first. I'm not, I'm not here judging anybody. I'm not here putting anybody down because I'll be the first to say, you don't always see that in me. I shared this on Friday night. I probably shouldn't share it to the whole congregation, but I'm going to. I was frustrated with traffic on Friday night. I was getting, I was getting hotter and hotter under the collar because I wanted to get home. I had a long day. I had RU coming up. At, I wanted to be here by 6 o'clock, and I was running to, to Payway in Springfield, and everybody and their mother got in front of me and slowed me down. Have you ever been there? You've been there. I got up to the light in Springfield. And there were probably about 15 cars in front of me. 
and the light only that two cars or three cars go at a time. And I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and, and finally the light changed and one car went and another car went and the car in front of me could have gone but it just started turning yellow and he stopped. And I said, no way! And I went around him and ran the light. I know, you're all saying, oh, the pastor did what? But do you know something? We're all guilty. Where's holiness in that? And then after I did it, I thought, Tom Reader, I just passed. And he's looking at me saying, there goes my pastor. <laughs> but don't we all struggle with this? The Word of God tells us Mary praised God that he is holy. You know, what a, what a lesson we can learn from this, and I, we don't have time to look into that, but, you know, we need to understand that. He also, she also prays, and she also prays him for his mercy in verse 50. Look what it says in verse 50. In verse 50 it says, and his mercy is on those who fear him. What a wonderful blessing to know that God's mercy is on us. Because I'll tell you what, Friday night, if his mercy wasn't on me, I wouldn't be here today. Because God would have said, Randy, that's enough. You're done. God doesn't act that way. But he's merciful. Do you know what the word term mercy means? It means compassion. He's moved with compassion. I read, a, read an article from the web, uh, on, on the web, on the, web um, on the internet. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a webpage called Seeds of Faith, and it was an article that was published there on, that, uh, on the internet on August the 30th, and I, I don't know anything about that. I, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing that, internet, that, that website. I'm just saying that's where I got this information. Um, it made a comment. It says compassion means to be moved, um, or to be moved with compassion means to be touched to the deepest part of being. And I thought, you know, I thought of Matthew chapter 9 in verse 36, where Christ said this, but when he saw the multitude, or the word of God says this, when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. Christ is moved to the very core of his being for you and for me. What a blessing that is. He was moved so much that he was willing to come to earth, give up, you know, who he was to take on man, to die of a curse so that you and I could have eternal life. That's compassion. And then also in verses 52 and 53, we find the justice of God. We find his justice. You know, again, we're not focusing, Mary's not focusing on the baby. Mary could have taken all these things and said, Lord, I'm just so happy you gave me this child. And, and, and she doesn't focus on the baby. She focuses on the sovereignty of God. Because she goes in verse 52 and 53, she says this, He has put down the, might, the, the mighty of their thrones and exalted the lowly. And what she's saying here is God's going to have his way in the end. He's going to make things right. He has promised it. We can count on it. God will make things right. Isaiah 61, in verses 1 through 3, if you're taking notes, write those, write those verses down because in Psalm 61, verses 1, 1 through 3, it talks about how God is going to, is going to uh, minister to those who are poor and going to pu pull down those who are rich. And, and he's going to make things, uh, he's going to uh, comfort the, uh, the, those who mourn and he's going to console those who, uh, who mourn. He's going to give beauty for ashes and uh, the oil of joy for the mourning. It goes on and talks about how God is going to set things right because of who he is. I love Isaiah chapter 53, I think it's in verse 12, where God says that it's at, his, it's at Christ's feet because he was willing to take our stripes for us, that he, is, he uh, it, was, it was at his feet that God placed all things. In, uh, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse, verse 9 through 11, it talks about how every knee will bow. And then Mary also praises God. Again, not for a baby, but he praises God for God's faithfulness. God is a faithful God. What a wonderful promise that is. 
You know, that's, that, that's Mary's praise. But in verse 48, we find Mary's humility. And, and I really can't stop right here without looking very briefly at verse 48. Look what it says in verse 48. It says, For he has regarded the lowly estate of his handmaid, and behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. You know, we, all, we always are very careful that we don't call Mary blessed, you know, the Blessed Mary. Why? Because the Catholics, and, and, and I think the Catholics has, have, have taken this doctrine and pulled it way out of proportion. But the Word of God says that Mary will be blessed. Generations will speak of her and of her righteousness. You know, I tend to think this, that when we walk in righteousness and we walk the way God wants us in holiness and we, we walk the way God has called us to walk, for generations, people will remember what we have done. We find here that there is a blessing in being humble before God. God doesn't want a proud heart or a haughty heart. God wants a humble heart. Listen to some of these verses, if you will. Um, it says this in Psalm 18, verse 27. It says, for you will save the humble and will bring down the haughty looks. In, in, uh, in Psalm 25 and verse 9, it says this, the humble, he guides in justice. Talks again, again in James chapter 4 and verse 6, he says this, yeah, but uh, he gives more grace, therefore he says, resist the proud, but give grace to the humble. In Proverbs 11, 2, it says, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. In Proverbs 15, in verse 33, it says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. God gives the humble, hum God gives the humble honor. You know, we want honor, we want recognition, we want all those things, and so we try to do it the world's way. You know what the Word of God says? The Word of God says, The, last, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Humble yourself. That's what Mary did. Mary was a humble woman. Mary was willing to say, okay, Lord, it's not about me. I don't know what I'm going to go through in the next nine months, but I am willing to do it for you. Because, Lord, you're my Savior. You're my Lord. And I know that you will be faithful. Is that our testimony today? Are we humble people? Are we proud people? Are we people who like the recognition or are we people who are willing to just go through and, and do things behind the scenes and, and not, you know, it's not about us getting the credit, but it's about giving all glory and honor to our Lord and Savior. Is that who you are today? That's who God wants us to be. Mary praised God, her song, of pra her song of praise. Lord, pr I want to praise you. Let's take this season and praise God. We, of we often, um, at least in America, we, uh, we separate praise from Christmas because praise takes place at Thanksgiving. That's not what the Bible says. Here, when we celebrate the birth of Christ, we need to give God the glory. We need to give him the praise. Because God has chosen you and chosen me to do things. He was willing to die for us. And he says, now it's your turn. Live for me. Are we willing to do that? Let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you are a God who loved us enough to come as a baby to die on a cruel tree. That, Lord, you were willing to call a humble young lady to um, a, a holy righteous woman not sinless but righteous one who walked with you and lord i do thank you that lord you call us if we know you as our lord and savior you will call us to serve you and lord i pray that you would help us to be faithful in all things knowing that lord you are a god who is faithful and so lord we don't have to fear but we can stand firm knowing that our god will be with us and so lord i ask today that lord you would enable us to be um, to walk humbly, holy, righteously before you. I do thank you. In your name we pray. Before all, any eyes are open, before any heads are, are raised, I want you to keep your eyes closed, I want you to keep your head bowed. 
I tell children all the time, you keep your eyes closed, your head bowed, and your hands folded. It's so you don't, uh, I don't want you looking around. It's not so I don't, I don't care if you really look around, but I don't want you be playing with other things and touching other things. I want you to just listen to my words right now. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, if you're watching online and you do not know Jesus Christ, you need to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus came as a baby to die on the cross for your sin. He came as a Savior, and you need to proclaim him. But what about you? Most, most of you in the congregation, and maybe most people watching today, know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can I ask you this? Have you accepted the task that God has given you? And have you done so humbly before God? Are you praising him through it? If you're not, you should be. You should be. If you're here today and you are going to be honest and say, you know, Pastor, I, I want to walk humbly before the Lord. I want to walk holy before God. And I don't, I don't, I'm not always as faithful as I should. Pastor, will you pray for me? Would you just raise your hand? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I thank you for the hands that went up. Lord, help us to make an impact in this world because of who you are and because of what you've done. Help us live humbly before you day in and day out. And it's so, it's so easy in my life to be humble now and then five minutes later, I take the credit for something. Help me keep my eyes on you at all times. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing, Great is thy faithfulness. God is a faithful God who will uh, minister to us. Great is thy faithfulness. verse says, pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Uh, what a blessing to know God pardons our sin, God ministers, God guides us. Let's just sing, great is thy faithfulness, just the chorus, Victoria. Uh, let's sing that together in closing. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. since he has a mic in front of him, if he could uh, thank the Lord for our service today and close us with prayer. Father, we do thank you for this service. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship with others, to praise you openly and, and alone. Father, we thank you for your word that you give us, the words that you give Pastor to, to uh, present. And uh, Father, we pray that you keep us safe as we go home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <laughs>